Today we're going to be talking about the issues of criminal justice in terms of the context of the area, looking at the statistics, uh, some of the inquiries, and the um, issue of racism in the criminal justice system. And we'll look at that by examining the Williams case from the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, before I do so, I just want to note that tonight, for fun, there's that movie that the Indigenous Law Students uh, Group is putting on, uh, Smoke Signals. Um, I think it's going to be over in the... Uh, first People Dance, it starts at 5, and we're showing the movie at 6.30. We have four different types of set costumes, a veggie, um, a beef, a moose, and a deer. It's a veggie, beef, moose, and deer stew at yes. 5 o'clock, and then the movie starts at 6.30 in the First People's House. So, you know, if you're interested, a little break, that's kind of a fun thing to be able to do. Um, secondly, I will, at the end of this class, give back the quizzes um, that uh, people wrote. And as soon as I get back to my office, I'll post online the answer guide so that you can see how I marked the exam, what, I, what the things I was looking for against the um, answers that you gave. Uh, people did uh, uh, generally very well. Um, the grades uh, are between 23 out of 30 and 27 out of 30, so uh, people have done um, great. And I'll talk about the exam again next week, or for the first time maybe next week. Okay, so this issue of uh, justice, uh, dealing with Indigenous peoples and uh, criminal justice, there are four separate uh, issues that we're going to talk about today historical realities of Indigenous uh, peoples and their encounters with the criminal justice system. Uh, we'll look at the contemporary realities that are currently uh, facing Aboriginal peoples in this uh, system, which leads to um, some discussion of over-representation. And then finally, we'll look at this idea of systemic racism as found in the Williams case. So that's the outline for the lecture. Uh, we begin by noting the fact that report after report has said through the past 30, 40 years that the justice system has failed Aboriginal peoples. In fact, uh, the justice system is regarded as being in crisis in relationship to Aboriginal peoples. This is from the Supreme Court's own wording in uh, the Gladue case. Uh, and this crisis is getting worse, not better. And this conclusion about it getting worse, not better, has been around since 1974. And so over these past um, 30 some odd years, uh, 40 years even, there's this sense of just heading over a cliff uh, in this field. And in order to understand some of the aspects of how Aboriginal peoples perceive the justice system, it's important to look at some of the historic roots of where we are. And uh, in the materials, there's this reproduction of a small excerpt from the Caribou Chilcotin Justice Inquiry of 1993. Um, this um, um, judge here, Anthony Sarich, was assisted by uh, Marion uh, Buller Bennett, who's now herself a judge. They went to the Caribou Chilcotin area uh, to hear about uh, why it was there was such a big overrepresentation of Aboriginal peoples in the justice system at that time. And they were met time after time after time with stories about what happened in 1864. And this story is connected to the Chilcotin case, right? the case that we looked at in the Aboriginal title context. Uh, here uh, in 1864, um, there, was a, there were leaders of a war party who regarded themselves as Chilcotin people as defending their land and their people. Um, they talk about the surveyors that were coming into the area and their desecration of the graves, the brutish conduct of the road builders, the um, abuse, uh, violence against indigenous women uh, by these uh, surveyors uh, that were coming through along with the other parties. And of course, the smallpox was also occurring at the time, and so people were facing um, the disease at the time of all of these other challenges. And so this war party 
um, protesting these incursions on the land um, ended up uh, committing themselves, uh, acts of war, taking life, and then there was a peace, truce, the chiefs thought was called, and in response to that peace truce, they um, walked into some meetings. It turned out uh, that they were treated as criminals, not as uh, parties engaged in kind of war, nation to nation, and under that, what they view was their false, um, the being misled as to what they would receive when they were coming to talk, um, they were um, charged and um, found guilty, and then they were hanged as a result of uh, these activities. The chief judge uh, at the time, uh, uh, Matthew Begbie, had suspicions about whether or not this was a fair process that these chiefs were being subjected to, uh, but nevertheless, um, the trial went ahead and this uh, show of these hangings um, left, as the judge says, a deep wound in the body of Chilcotin uh, society. So these people did not forget uh, this experience, and so when they were talking about criminal justice issues in 1993, the idea was that they had no trust in the criminal justice system because of the way that it was first introduced amongst them. They just thought it was a political process um, that, uh, you know, as these, their own people at that time were still being tried, um, it was as if uh, there was no understanding or um, acceptance of the idea that this was a fair uh, process. You also see the same kind of um, history set in on the plains in Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta, um, where the hanging of uh, uh, Louis Riel, the leader of the Métis Rebellion, uh, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People said, left indelible scars on the collective memory of the Métis people. The perceived injustice of the trial has been compounded by the history of dispossession of the Métis peoples. The trial and execution of eight Cree leaders who allied themselves with Riel and the Métis and who were hanged on a single scaffold in the Northwest Mounted Police Courtroom in Battleford, Saskatchewan in 1885 continues to cast a long shadow over the descendants of those who were executed for the crime of defending their land. So what you have in both of these instances is that people who are regarded with high esteem, the leaders of their people, those who would be most respected are criminalized for their actions in defending their rights and not only criminalized but in these cases put to death. Now you might think 1864, 1885, that's a long time ago to be able to continue to harbor those feelings. Uh, but when that's a, that's the creation story, but that's at the genesis of the relationship between uh, Métis people and the Crown, between these Cree people like Big Bear and others and the Crown, or in the case of the Chilcotin, it's at the genesis of, it's at the heart of the creation story of how they regard Canada uh, coming in to their territory. And if you look around the world, uh, you see in many places how these deep wounds do not go away in a single generation or five, right? It takes a long time uh, to be able to overcome some of those uh, challenges. Questions or comments about that historical route? We could say uh, more in many parts of the country. In the, in the Arctic, for instance, uh, you have a similar experience um, uh, amongst the uh, Tlingit and uh, Inuit and Dene people. Their first encounters of the RCMP are not always of this orderly force that's sent on to protect them. It's actually protecting other people, not protecting indigenous uh, peoples. 
Uh, you find in Ontario, um, again, many of the leaders that were using their uh, authority to try to deal with peace and order um, by themselves, maybe putting people to death or banishing or separating them out, um, those people were criminalized for those actions. Yes. That's right. So what you've got here with the Chilcotin case is a kind of difference of opinion, obviously huge, about who has sovereignty in this territory. As it was just said, 1846, Treaty of Oregon, between the uh, powers of Great Britain and the United States, seem to assume that north of the um, Columbia River, certainly north of the 49th parallel, there would be British sovereignty there. Um, but you know, the Chilcotin people weren't involved in that decision wasn't self-executing from their perspective. And they felt themselves um, able to protect their territory and they could not understand why an agreement between two other parties that didn't involve them would surrender their ability to deal with their lands. And uh, Louis Riel, if you read his speeches, also had some of those similar um, concerns in his work. Okay, so we can take this forward though. This isn't just a historic um, issue. It also is uh, very uh, contemporary. Um, in the Osnaburg Windigo Tribal Justice Committee Review of 1990 in Ontario, um, the court talks about the dispossession of First Nations people in their own lands as being accomplished through the criminal justice system stuff we've studied about land titles and treaties isn't just kind of a property or contract law issue, it's also a criminal justice issue. Um, the justice system and all of its manifestations, this report concludes, uh, from the police to the court to corrections is seen as a foreign one, designed to continue the cycle of poverty and powerlessness. It is evident that the frustration of First Nations communities is internalized. The victims faced with what they experience as a repressive and racist society uh, victimize themselves. And the system in the eyes of most First Nations in these areas lacks legitimacy and is seen as being very repressive. One of our main institutions of what we think is to keep law and order in this country is just regarded as an anathema to law and order. It's anything but. It's, it's the polar opposite of what the intent of the system is, which is to provide protection and help. It, it you know, whatever the, op the opposite word of protection is, you know, that's what's regarded as being accomplished. And again, this isn't just indigenous people saying this. This is like 40 years of reports from judges and lawyers and uh, uh, learned uh, people. So Donald Marshall in 1971 was a 17 year old youth in Nova Scotia when he was involved in a confrontation. Uh, this confrontation led him to serve 11 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. He was convicted of murder on the strength of false testimonies obtained through coercive uh, police action. Um, in fact, even during the trial, one of the Crown witnesses came forward to the prosecution and testified, like said, I've lied. I didn't tell the truth uh, what I, about what I said regarding uh, Donald Marshall, but this um, was not pursued by the Crown. Um, and then 10 days later after this, the police received important evidence strongly implicating another as the perpetrator of the crime. And the police uh, did not uh, question Marshall again, 
because he'd already been found guilty. And so 10 days after this uh, trial had concluded, the person comes forward. They don't follow it up because they already have a guilty uh, conviction. So he serves 11 years in prison. Uh, but eventually, uh, the truth uh, emerges. Uh, he is innocent of this uh, uh, um, charge and crime. And the Crown admitted that Marshall should have been acquitted. Because this is, you know, now dealing with exoneration. But the Crown, in admitting this acquittal, also asked the court if they would um, exonerate the police to preserve the criminal justice system's uh, perceived credibility. And the court seemed to oblige. And so this guy's out of jail. It's clear he hasn't committed the crime. The Crown admits that. The Crown comes back and says, well, you've got a problem here. You know, if, if you don't see the police as being honest here, then we've got a, um, an issue as to how we're perceived in the general public. And so the court came to the conclusion that um, any misfortune that Donald Marshall faced um, was such that he was to blame for the tragedy that had befallen him because of his suspicious activity at the time, even though he was innocent. And the Court of Appeal declared that any miscarriage of justice, therefore, is more apparent than real. So this uh, led to an inquiry, um, the fact that the court seems to have come to the aid of the Crown, come to the aid of the police when Donald Marshall is clearly innocent. This led to an inquiry, and uh, this inquiry said the justice system has <laughs> failed Donald Marshall at every turn, from his arrest to his conviction and beyond, even including his exoneration. He's even failed at that point. And on page uh, uh, 1050, you can read some of those um, findings of the commission. Donald Marshall was not the author of his own misfortune. His miscarriage of justice was real and not simply apparent. We went through these conclusions when we were talking about the Marshall case uh, a few uh, weeks ago. The fact that Marshall was a native was a factor in his wrongful conviction. Um, the fact that he was native was one of the reasons that he was the prime suspect. The prosecutor and the defense at trial failed to discharge their obligations towards Marshall. The cumulative effect of the incorrect rulings denied Donald Marshall a fair trial. Um, the prosecutor and the defense here uh, were, uh, had a serious breach in their standards of professional conduct. The fact that the Court of Appeals said that is, uh, this injustice is more apparent than real um, is a fundamental error. The, the court, in drawing this conclusion in his exoneration, um, um, selectively, selectively used the evidence before it. And the court took upon itself to convict Marshall of a robbery which he was never charged. The court was in error when it said that Marshall admittedly committed perjury. He did not commit perjury. The court's suggestion of his untruthfulness was also not supported by the evidence. Um, the court, the, sorry, the Commission of Inquiry says the, the court's decision at this exoneration hearing amounted to a defense of the criminal justice system at Marshall's expense, notwithstanding overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And so given the findings of this commission, the action then moved on to a judicial inquiry from the Canadian Judicial Council, um, inquiring into whether this misconduct by these uh, five judges of the Court of Appeal would justify their removal. And the court comes to the conclusion that they made an error in law but they didn't uh, rise to the standard sufficiently to warrant their removal from the bench. Although the court does say this, this sorry, judicial counsel says this, 
Um, we wish to state at the outset our strong disapproval of the language used by the reference court, the incongruity between the court's legal conclusion that he was innocent and its observations that this miscarriage was more apparent than real. Um, it cannot be termed more apparent than real, the Commission of Inquiry, so the Canadian Judicial Council says. Um, in fact, uh, any reasonable person, the council says, would regard this language as inappropriate. So they, they disapprove, they regard this language as inappropriate, but they say you can't remove someone from the bench from, uh, for merely uh, making an error in judgment about the law here. So uh, these people, although they had mostly uh, stepped down or gone to super, uh, uh, super, supernumerary status, um, nevertheless were able to continue to uh, sit on the bench. And so uh, that's how the Marshall Inquiry was left, uh, um, deeply criti critical of the justice system in um, Nova Scotia, but nevertheless leaving uh, the people in place. And this uh, kind of history is uh, something that is replicated in all territories and provinces. This kind of language, these kinds of findings are not just limited to you know, the 1980s, uh, 90s with Donald Marshall, they're not just limited to 1864 with the Chilco team or 1885 with Real. We've got some of the list here. Um, I talked about the Osberg Windigo, the Law Reform Commission of Canada in 1991, the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry in 1991, which again reported out uh, 10 years after that fact, um, the report of the task force of the criminal justice system in Alberta, uh, Justice Patricia Lynn in Saskatchewan, the Sarich report that you've just seen, the two reports of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, there was a commission on First Nations and Métis Peoples and Justice Reform in 2003. There's an inquiry into the death of Dudley George in 2005. In 2013, there was a Yakabuchi uh, First Nations representation on juries report out of Ontario. Um, this just goes on and on and on. I think over 30, I mean, if we stack these up, uh, over 30 of these reports. Um, and then there's the more recent, uh, in the last couple of years, Neil Stone child. Um, you might be aware of this phenomena where if there were young, uh, not even so young often, Indians who were regarded as intoxicated and uh, were regarded as needing a lesson from the police rather than throw them into jail and send overnight in uh, that place to sober up, they would often be driven you know, out of the town out of uh, Saskatoon and uh, left there to sober up by walking back. Uh, the problem is uh, minus 28 degrees, intoxicated, driven out of town, left, um, in this case, uh, Neil Stonechild uh, Parish. There was an inquiry into whether or not the police uh, committed uh, manslaughter in this regard by um, the allegations that he was left to his death. And in the inquiry, it was found there was not enough evidence uh, to be able to uh, charge these police officers uh, with manslaughter. They were fired. And uh, the report uh, came out with a series of recommendations that the Saskatchewan police has tried to implement um, but prevent that way of proceeding anymore. Um, but uh, there, in the Frank Paul case here in British Columbia, you got the same thing occurring. And uh, another kind of inquiry that leads to the same kind of recommendations that were there in the Stone Child inquiry. Um, last year, um, maybe 18 months ago, Tina Fontaine, a young 17-year-old uh, girl had sought uh, the help of the police, had sought the help of um, um, her, her child welfare um, uh, workers, social workers, um, didn't receive that aid, uh, 
was the subject of violence and uh, dumped in the river, in the Red River. And the uh, outrage around that um, led to some action to try to change the way this has occurred. But, but noting the link to last class, um, what was happening here was these young people were in the child welfare system in Manitoba, and um, they were put into hotels because there weren't sufficient families or resources to be able to watch over them. And in these hotels, um, under the care of the Children's Aid Society, these young women were often subject to abuse. And so, you know, who became around that place? And uh, yet they would ask for help, and uh, they wouldn't receive it. And in this case, this woman was actually, um, I'm actually not sure of these facts, but in some cases, these women would face the, um, the other children in care that would be the perpetrators of the abuse or even lead to the death of these young women. The Manitoba Children's Aid Society has now stopped uh, this practice of putting these kids in hotels. Um, but you can see the connection, I think, to what we've been talking about last class around uh, child welfare, which links to the classes before in dealing with uh, uh, the issues of violence against Indigenous women. And we know the statistics in relationship to uh, murdered and uh, missing uh, Indigenous women, uh, which uh, runs uh, well into uh, the hundreds, if not thousands, and the request for an inquiry which will now go on. Wally Opal in British Columbia, who was a former uh, judge and former attorney general of the province of British Columbia, was tasked with um, having uh, an inquiry into uh, missing uh, women in British Columbia. Here are the, here's the scope of the inquiry to inquire into and make findings of fact respecting the conduct of investigations conducted between January 23rd, 97, February 5th, 2002 by police forces in British Columbia respecting women reported missing from the downtown east side of the city of Vancouver. An inquiry into and make findings of fact respecting the decision of the criminal justice branch on 1998, January 27th, to stay the proceedings of Robert Picton of the attempted murder, assault with a weapon, forcible confinement, and aggravated assault. You know, his a failure to um, prosecute him in 1998 uh, led to many more women uh, being murdered uh, by him. Um, third, third, recommend changes necessary respecting the initiation of conduct of investigations in British Columbia of missing women and suspected multiple homicides. And then finally, recommend changes considered necessary respecting homicide investigations by more than one uh, investigating organization, including coordination. And then submit a final report. Um, this uh, commission uh, went forward. It closed its doors in 2013. I did not have the support of the families who had um, their sisters, daughters, mothers, grandmothers, did not have the support of the families of the women who were the subject of these um, misdeeds. And one of the reasons for that uh, was that they felt they couldn't tell their own stories in their own terms because of the narrower framing of the inquiry, uh, focusing on uh, police uh, investigations between uh, those dates. And uh, because things were focused on the police at investigations, quite understandably so, the police put forward a strong defense about what they were involved with in these actions. And so the inquiry had a very um, criminal justice trial feel. Uh, it didn't uh, necessarily, in the family's views, and then in many Aboriginal organizations' uh, views, get to the broader um, issues that were involved with this um, um, Opal Inquiry did 
Judge Bobo, wonderful person, tried to do the best he can. He tried to take account of broader background facts, um, but you know, there's some limitations. One of the questions I would have for you is if you were drafting the terms of inquiry for a national uh, missing and murdered women um, inquiry, what might you pull on? What might you include within the scope of uh, that review? Ideally? So looking to traditional ways of disclosure in figuring out uh, that this is a sui generis uh, process that you might need to engage here, the morally and politically defensible um, national <laughs> missing and murdered women inquiry can't just law draw on criminal law procedure, can't even just draw on civil law understandings, <laughs> would have to take account of you know, indigenous um, ways of proceeding. So right, so try to find a way from the get-go to have those women uh, be front and center in terms of the support systems being available, in terms of them being able to tell their stories uh, about what uh, happened to them. You'll probably see I sent out a little notice about a report series that's happening in the Globe and Mail right now around serial killers and uh, Indigenous women. It would be helpful, I think, if you looked at that. I know this is terrible subject matter uh, to be able to consider, um, but if we're going to get answers to some of these questions, we have to look at the depth of the issue there, and some of those stories help us maybe craft a broader sense of the proper scope for an inquiry. Other things? So the decision maker or the, the, the finder of fact in the inquiry um, might themselves be indigenous. If they're not, they might have that um, um, assistance. And so for instance, often these petition inquiries are run by judges. We know there's like a handful of Aboriginal judges in the country, maybe 20 or so. That's unlikely that uh, unless you pull on Murray Sinclair again, or Judge uh, <laughs> um, Bond, that we're going to get an Aboriginal judge, although it's possible. Um, we could uh, uh, draw on your suggestion. Yeah. Now, what are the unique part of the problem is that you can, like, your prosecution is really like, maybe it's kind of like too aggressive and it's going after the information kind of in its own interest. Like, almost if you had, you kind of broke that rule apart and you had one person, one kind of entity that's job was to just kind of elicit as much information, you know, looking at crime on a day-to-day -day basis that's yep. brought up, that's just really trying to draw the information. And then once the information is out there, you have another kind of like independent party that's actually there to kind of okay. do the prosecution. So it's trying to, trying to just create something where it's more kind of, it's just easier for people to come forward. Yeah. And just one person's job is entirely just, or one entity's job is entirely just to try and, you know, be not judge and yeah. just get the information. So that's interesting, almost like a two-step inquiry where one is about um, sort of the information elicitation, and the other part of it is then the judgments that's made in relationship to the gathering of that information. That's how it works in, in New Zealand with the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, you have um, sort of a report stage, and once that report stage is finished, um, and that often involves many parties, um, anthropologists, historians, elders, um, political leaders, uh, lawyers, etc. That's the report function, and then it goes on to a tribunal function where there's more of a hearing uh, about judging that information. And then even then, the third part of this is it then goes to Parliament, and Parliament has a final say, and, and Parliament must respond. Like in the, the scoping out of the Waitangi, I think it's Waitangi history, in the Waitangi processes, when a report is 
adjudicated on by the tribunal, the Italian tribunal, and some conclusions are reached, the parliament must respond to those conclusions. That would be an interesting part of the scoping out of a national inquiry that the parliament can't just leave it on the shelf, um, but there's an obligation uh, somehow. Other things that uh, occur to you? Yes. It seems like there's almost two goals of any possible inquiry. One would be for like family members or patients to sort of tell their story and finally be heard. And we, you guys, I think for years, there was this big, big promise that they weren't being heard, this person was sort of being pushed down. On the other side, there's a possible indictment of the criminal justice system that was not It seems like if you also inquire into maybe sort of the accurate criminal justice inquiry, that maybe could have been better done. Yeah. So this is a good point again, which draws on the last point we were making. It seems like there's um, different objectives that need to be considered, and uh, so the terms need to have both a criminal justice and a wider societal um, uh, framing. So indigenous peoples themselves should be um, part of the framing of the terms of reference by being brought into the process, consulted, and you could do that in many different ways. There's obviously national, regional, political organizations that could give uh, their feedback. There are the families of these uh, women who could also give their feedback. Um, in some respects, uh, it's likely that that's what's happening, but. Um, it might not be broad enough to some people's satisfaction. And the question becomes how far do you go with that too, right? Um, it could delay the process from ever starting. But not doing it could also mean that the process doesn't have any legitimacy again in the eyes of the people. So how do you get the kind of the just right way of uh, doing that consultation? Interesting, as we're talking here, I'm hoping you're casting your eyes back all parts of the courts, right? So in framing up this inquiry, why wouldn't we take guidance from some of the things that we were told in the Hyder case, you know, the Taku uh, Klinka case, the Miccosuit case? Think about reconciliation, consultation, accommodation. Yes, we're not dealing with Aboriginal rights, necessarily, <coughs> uh, but there might be some good policy governance matters in that. What other parts of the courts would you draw in to thinking about the scoping of this inquiry. And you can be obvious if you want. Yes. Um, I guess I, I would sort of look back to the, the way in which um, the government of the right has been circumscribed um, because they don't want to be sociology <laughs> and their form of government, I would say. Um, if you look at the factors that lead Aboriginal women to be more vulnerable than any other whites, um, I, I think that an awful lot of that would turn out to be based on a sort of economic and class type issue. Yes. Um, so the lack of um, community control over their own economic wealth and their economic affairs, and the factors, the ways that Yeah, so the issue of governance could be really relevant to scoping this out. Again, a concern about getting too broad in scope, and there's been lots of cautions in the media about not doing that. But if one of the causes of this is that people don't have control over their lives, uh, both uh, within their own uh, First Nations context and uh, then more generally within their, their nation context, perhaps something 
um, that gives people a greater sense of control, a greater sense of ownership of their own destiny uh, could, who knows, maybe not, it could uh, be a factor there. Other parts of the quotes you draw upon them? So I want you to think about this. This could be a good second question for an exam. What, what would we learn from residential school? What would we learn from child welfare? Um, what would we learn from consultation? What would we learn from governance? Um, what lessons would we even take from the title intrusions experience if we were crafting an inquiry that had a scope that actually tried to address some of these issues? Well, you'll both hear uh, his um, preface to the report said most of us will never have to worry about where we will get our next meal, what we will do to get the money we need to live, or where to sleep. We don't understand what it feels like to be consumed by fears about our physical safety and yet afraid to contact the police. On our own, easily forsaken, forsaken. That is the story of the missing and murdered women. The missing and murdered women were forsaken by society at large, and then again by the police. The pattern of predatory violence was clear and should have been met with a swift and severe response by accountable and professional <coughs> institutions, but it was not. To paraphrase Maggie DeVries, sister of murder victim Sarah DeVries, there should have been mayhem searches, media interest, and rewards, but these responses only trickled in over the course of many years. Despite the narrow framing of the inquiry, something of that spirit, I think, would have to pervade uh, a national inquiry. But it's not an easy issue to frame out the scope. It could be so broad that it becomes like the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, a great set of materials for a professor to put into a case book teach uh, people year after year, but really has no solid policy and legal implications <coughs> except for from time to time when the Supreme Court cites the Royal, Co the Royal Commission. Um, too broad, you run that risk. Too narrow, you run the risk of uh, what the Royal Commission um, encountered. That's not to say that uh, either of those are off the table and you can do broad better than maybe the Royal Commission did. Maybe you can even do narrow better than the Oval Commission did if it's you know, got the proper um, consultations and framing out of different issues we've been talking about. So what are the statistics here? Uh, this is the Office of the Correctional, Co Correctional Investigator. There was a report in February uh, 2013 concerning outcome gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal offenders. Aboriginal offenders, uh, when they're in prison, are routinely classified as higher risk and in higher need of employment, community reintegration, and family support. Therefore, they're released later in their sentence. They have lower parole grant rates. Most leave prison at the statutory release date or when their warrant expiry date occurs. So Aboriginal peoples spend much longer time in custody and jail than non-Aboriginal peoples because of their classifications. They're also overrepresented in segregation and maximum security populations. They are disproportionately involved in the use of force interventions and uh, collision uh, self-injury. This is like once you're in the system. They're more likely to return to prison on parole, parole revocation, most often for administrative reasons, not actually for criminal violations. And while Aboriginal peoples comprise 4% of the population, they are 23% of the federal inmate uh, population. 71% First Nations, 24%, and 85% Inuit. Here are some uh, 
uh, statistics about the rates of overrepresentation here of Aboriginal adults in contrast to non-Aboriginal adults. So you can just see by the red bars being the non-Aboriginal population and the blue bars being the Aboriginal adult population. Overrepresentation just so graphically um, uh, represented there at Saskatchewan. Almost 80% of the people in provincial incarcerations there are Aboriginal. Here's the youth rates, and uh, you can see um, they're very similar. And again, huge over representation. So this isn't just 1864 or the Riel Rebellion or Donald Marshall or the Royal Commission in 1996, this is today. So, um, again, going to the Office of the Correctional Investigator, um, what are some of the factors impacting over-representation of Aboriginal peoples in correction? This is ha um, Howard Sapers, um, that ran this report. His son is still here in the next year. So, systemic discrimination and attitudes based on racial and cultural prejudice, economic and social disadvantage, substance abuse, and intergenerational loss, uh, aka residential school, violence and trauma, such as residential school effects. So this is all the parts of the course that are now relevant to studying criminal justice. Experience in child welfare or adoption systems. Effects of dislocation and dispossession of Aboriginal peoples. Not having your title recognized. Not having your treaty rights affirmed so that your life on a reserve is just so marginal. Uh, family and community history of suicide, substance abuse, and victimization. Loss of or struggle with cultural and spiritual identity. Ironically, um, some of the um, kind of spiritual people you will find in Aboriginal communities are those who have been incarcerated, if they can get that help. Uh, they've discovered sweat lodges, they've discovered what's called the Red Road, and uh, they try to, through rekindling or recalibration of their spiritual identity, get their way out of that system. I used to, when I taught in the University of British Columbia with Michael Jackson, go out to the Mac Matsky uh, prison, and in that prison you would visit with <coughs> Aboriginal inmates and make real attempts spiritually and culturally to reclaim uh, themselves was a part of their journey. A low lack or level of uh, um, formal education. Uh, I forget, there's a, a statistic, there's a statistic in the materials um, that uh, most uh, uh, people in um, the prison who are Aboriginal have not um, uh, completed even uh, public school, secondary school, let alone high school. Poverty, poor living conditions, exposure, and membership to Aboriginal street gangs. There's a really great new graphic novel by a woman named Patty um, Labacon Benson, who um, has a PhD, she works in the criminal justice system for Aboriginal organizations. Um, this novel um, really does present a good picture. When you don't have your identity reflected in mainstream society or in your community very easily, uh, these people turn to one another and they create in those gangs a kind of a tribe, a kind of a place of belonging which often does not go well. So the Gladue decision here We'll read about this uh, next Wednesday. It says, to be clear, courts must take judicial notice of such matters as the history of colonialism, displacement, and residential schools, and how that history continues to translate into lower educational attainment, lower incomes, higher unemployment, higher rates of substance abuse and suicide, and of course, higher levels of incarceration for Aboriginal peoples. Court of Canada counsel to other judges as to how to interpret this phenomenon. Now, I think it's important at this point to say, again, as I've said before, people aren't just 
hopeless victims swept up in this sweep of despair. Some are. But so many people try in their own way to continue to be resilient and find spaces to pry open um, that they can craft their own path. And uh, people need also to take responsibility for themselves. Let's not let people off the hook. But sometimes the levels of responsibilities that people can bear vary. What I can be responsible for is different than my 29-year-old daughter who has autism. There's just only so much that she can do. She can do a lot. Um, there's a lot of capacity and ability in her life. And she sometimes outstrips me and us in the way that she leads her life in, a, in an independent uh, way. But there's nevertheless constraints that she faces in uh, her ability to be responsible. And likewise, it would be the case to make sure that when we talk about responsibility, that we properly calibrate that, and we recognize some of the limitations. We're not just all equally born free to just go forward and have the whole world you know, lie at our feet with great education and job opportunities and relationship uh, support. Right? There's just many factors that can get in the way. And yet, uh, even as we say um, those factors getting in the way, um, we just need to keep our eyes open to the complexities in that. I know it comes back to that many times, um, but I, I just think it, it needs to be said that it's, just, it's not all blank and without responsibility here on this side. There's a couple of, uh, I think this has now gone dead, but you can look at this um, Aboriginal Prison population has risen 23%. I can't remember the timing that, that was in, but you know, in a 10 year kind of period. This is the idea, it's getting worse, it's not getting better. Albert Memmi, um, a Tunisian Jewish writer, uh, observing life in the post-World War II period um, in Africa, talked about decolonization, uh, talked about uh, racism, and, he, and for him, this was one way of measuring uh, racism. It stresses, first, a real or imaginary difference between the racist and, and its victim. Then assigns values to these differences to the advantage of the racist to the detriment of the victim. Then tries to make these absolute by generalizing from these differences that are assigned values in claiming that they are final and then finally justifying uh, present or possible aggression or privilege uh, based on those past assessments. So, Aboriginal peoples are different. Um, they don't have the same agricultural system, they don't have contact. They don't have the same agricultural society, they don't have the same religion, they don't have the same social organization. They just have different kinds of laws, different kinds of orientations to the world, part one, part two. And they're inferior. That social organization is not as conducive to order as parliaments and courts. It, uh, the religious beliefs aren't as defined as Christian teachings that were given. Inferior, you're pagan, you're savage. Um, and we notice that about uh, this one group, uh, say, uh, that we encounter along the coast. All Indians are like that. Um, they all have these different and inferior beliefs, organizations, attempts to be able to organize themselves in the world. And therefore, we're going to create the law of property, the law of contract, the law of obligation in our, in our image. Well, eventually, the first three points drop away, by and large, not fully. People no longer think 
all the time that the difference between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples is one of inferiority. And people wouldn't try to justify what's going on today on the basis of that past justification. But we've hardwired into the system a way of organizing society that's often based on those prior judgments. And the fact to ask questions about um, this is to be regarded as being offside in trying to unpack what's going on today because this just looks so neutral and objective and fair. Well, everyone can participate in these kind of rules that we set up, so what's the problem? Um, you know, that's, a, that's uh, one way of approaching this. You could disagree uh, with this rule. There's no party line in uh, this talk. Um, but that's one way that you might find uh, this approach. Questions or comments there? Some people don't think there is systemic racism and wouldn't want us to commit sociology or look at the kind of law and society factors. Why is that? And I'm serious, I'm not just trying to uh, be <coughs> critical of people that might take that approach. We need to understand it. Right? I mean, there, there are a lot of people who are doing quite well in the current system, mm -hmm. and, and I think that the thought of a change is, might be very, very scary to any one or two of them. Okay. So people are doing well on both sides. Perhaps you get some, um, so you get, in, by and large, Canadians do well, and so why would we change that? But then you get some Aboriginal people that do well, well, if they made it, like if you're teaching in a law school, or why can't everyone else do that? And so, you know, because people do well, it might be a reason for saying it's not systemic because you have examples of uh, people rising. Um, I think it has to do with the idea of having a society too where we say, oh, well, you have the opportunity to participate in democracy or participate in going to school or participate in anything really. Um, but without recognizing that there's so many barriers in place to certain people actually rising to that level to participate. And so if you're just looking at it from the perspective that, oh, well, those opportunities are there versus from the perspective of someone who can't even get to those opportunities. Yeah. And so it looks really fair from one perspective. Because there are opportunities. Um, the idea is that there's no systemic barriers to participation because you can come to university, you can um, uh, hopefully go on the job market and not be judged by your aboriginality or uh, cultural factors. Yeah. Are there the laws trying to change the society to change that? And so if it was there, do you think people would take it for granted? And the fact that if you went to school, people would, can be removed from some of the laws they take it for granted? And, uh, or you just see the fact that Vancouver's so far from Toronto and people are just looking at Toronto and yeah. they don't really know what's going on over there. Would you believe it's really contributed to the bottom of race? Okay, so there could be an uneven experience in observing, participating, being uh, proximate to um, racism that uh, has factors that aren't just individuated, but also are embedded in a way, a patterning of the way we operate. I think because a lot, you know, a lot of these justice, a lot of these kind of statements are made by people who have already participated for a week. So, you know, it kind of hurts their self-esteem to say, I succeeded because of my race. Um, even if that is the case, people like to think that they, you know, that they didn't have advantages because maybe they did have. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So again, a bit of your point. Uh, if you've succeeded, or if you're doing well, it's hard to admit that perhaps part of that success uh, could be structured uh, by the advantages you might have received that others don't receive um, as they go to school, or as they get health care, as they were raised in families. Um, I think um, a lot of the time people just are completely blind to the issue and so they can't come up with a really constructive argument for it. Even though the dealers in San Francisco are pretty hard to deal with. It's, it's really hard to deal with, right? And so to call it systemic, like how can we admit that? What, because it's a hard thing to then disentangle if it's not just an individuated thing, um, it could cause people to turn away, not look, not deal with. Yeah. And I think it has, I mean, maybe it's a little more nuanced 
So the solutions aren't apparent, easy. It's probably going to require trial and error to uh, deal with this. And again, in the midst of that kind of uncertainty and hard work, it might be difficult to um, recognize the systemic racism or, or try to tackle that. I mean, you just say, well, it's, you can, it's up to you. You can succeed. Just go ahead. You know, go up to your boots. So we could live in our silos and not necessarily encounter other people that have been impacted in one way that we've not been impacted in. Of course, we're talking about Aboriginal issues in this context, so we could reas easily you know, just throw the gates open and have you think more generally. I think you know, a lot of people have been born into the system and have felt really comfortable going to protect the bottom of the line and saying, you know, this broke my bones. Uh, yes. I so a resistance to absorbing blame for something that you feel is out of your control. I wrote an article in 2014, which I guess is still last year, in the, uh, the University of Toronto Law Journal um, about residential schools and reasons that people would be resistant to um, accepting responsibility for the residential school crimes. And I try to take those very seriously even as I try to answer some of those questions, but you're right. There is this sense, like, I'm not responsible for this. Like, it wasn't me. My family just came here from another country. My, you know, why should I have to bear the burdens of repairing this when I wasn't, my family wasn't a part of this? Or even if they were, why should I be judged for the behavior of my parents or my grandparents? Like, this is something that seems contrary to the kind of responsibility we do want to inculcate, which sees us you know, having responsibility for our own actions there. So, sorry, <clears throat> just tying this back to the murdered missing women inquiry, um, given the number of studies and reports we have basically coming to a conclusion that we have this systemic racism and all of these problems, and then all of the, the issues we've just described and it being hard for the privileged majority to kind of absorb that or address those conclusions. What is the fruit of a wider scoped murdered and missing women inquiry? Is it like you were talking about with the New Zealand thing, but if you tied it to like an actual duty on the Crown to respond in some sort of concrete way that there could be progress, or it's just another incremental step in raising awareness, or mm -hmm. just in a place of frustration, I guess. Yeah, it is a place of frustration, uh, because we can identify all these factors about why there might be systemic racism, why there could be resistance to labeling the fact doors in this way. Um, so what do you do? For me, I think this is the work of lawyers 
is that we start in the middle of the mess that we are in and try to make our way, comparatively speaking, to something that's better rather than worse. But if we were in Aiga or in literature or uh, political science, we might be able to start with a platonic imagined better place, um, one that has a kind of a forum that um, would not have us engage in this way and being complicit in all of the garbage that's a part of our current system. Um, and, and, and so you know, some people don't practice law or practice law in this way. We can think, we, you know, what we're doing here, even as we're trying to work through this, is just not only frustrating, but misguided because we're trying to reform something that seems just shot through with inequality, racism. So why bother? Like, let's just get something else. Like, put another system in place or another way of acting in the world. And, and there are lots of people that try to do that. Um, and, and good for them. It may be that they're right, that um, we need our total imagination changed. That's not the place I stand, maybe that's not the place as some of you stand, but we're going to practice. And uh, the practice is trying to take us from where we are with our frustrations, recognize all the com complex elements, and then eventually try to line them up. And there's a lot of reasons for being dispirited and hopeless in that. Um, but sometimes when I look in the rearview mirror and I see what's happened in my short life, which we too. There is a lot of change that's happened. It's not anywhere near what it needs to occur. And uh, in some ways, the status quo is still um, just very um, dispiriting, disheartening. Um, yet we, there's, uh, there's evidence otherwise to not always just take the path of frustration, dispiritedness, hopelessness. I could be a fool, though. I could be spending my entire life's action on something that's just not so capable of responding. But I think it is. Right? I do. And I've seen enough evidence for that to occur. But I think that evidence means I don't think it happens. So Williams, which is the case that the Supreme Court uh, decided that recognized that there's racism in society that's pervasive, that's resilient, that doesn't go away uh, just even by being aware of it. And they interpreted a provision in the criminal code to allow for jurors to be questioned um, for partiality or for bias that they might have to Aboriginal peoples. So here's the facts. There was a robbery here in town, a pizza store. And uh, the person, Victor Daniel Williams, who was charged with the robbery, um, said, I didn't do it. I was with someone else. That person did it. So he pled not guilty. And he wanted, in this case, to challenge potential jurors for their prejudice that they might hold against Aboriginal peoples. He said, in fact, uh, I don't want to be, um, I don't have the exact words, but I don't want to be dealt with by Indian haters, is kind of his, his sentiment. So the question is whether or not you can challenge jurors for their bias or their partiality, or their, there's a bunch of synonyms here on page 1061, paragraph nine of the decision, whether or not they're bigoted, discriminatory, favorably disposed towards, inclined, influenced, interested, jaundiced, narrow-minded, one-minded, one-sided, partisan, predisposed, prejudiced, prepossessed, prone, restricted, subjective, swayed, unbound, unequal, unequal, unfair, unjust, and justified, unreasonable. Can you ask jurors if they're any of those things? And the 
British uh, Columbia Court of Appeal said that general bias is insufficient uh, to be able to challenge uh, the impartiality of jurors. The Supreme Court of Canada overturned the British Columbia Court of Appeal, disagreed with that fact. So can you challenge jurors? Can you challenge jurors? Uh, can this be justified when there's evidence of widespread bias in a community? And the court said, yes, that is appropriate. So you can ask potential jurors if there's sufficient evidence of widespread bias or the judge takes judicial notice of it in his or her community, you can challenge, you can ask this person, are you one of these things, favorably disposed or in favor of disposed uh, in relationship to Aboriginal people. The court asks, what partiality? What is prejudice? They say there's four different types that we could detect. First of all, this idea of interest prejudice, which is when a juror has a direct stake in the trial because of their relationship to the defendant, victim, witness, or outcome. It's pretty easy, probably, to determine, you know, are you related? Do you have financial interest there? Secondly, is there specific prejudice, which involves attitudes and beliefs about the particular case that could render a juror being incapable of deciding guilt or innocence um, because of the publicity that might have surrounded the case in the mass media, or because of public discussions, or because of rumors in the community? Okay, so it's not <clears throat> that you have a direct stake in the, in, you know, like you're related to someone or going to get a benefit from it, but you've already formed an opinion in uh, some respects because of information that's floating around about that. Or there's a generic prejudice, which arises from stereotypical attitudes about the defendant, victims, or witnesses, or the nature of the crime itself, bias against a racial or ethnic group or against persons charged with, say, sex abuse, as an example of generic prejudice. The court's going to find this is the kind of prejudice that exists in Victoria. That there are there are biases against Aboriginal peoples here in this <coughs> town that make it difficult for them that can then give rise to a challenge as to whether or not that person would be impartial in sitting on the case. And then there's conformity prejudice, which is when there's a significant interest in the community causing a juror to perceive there be a strong community feeling about a case coupled with an experience about an outcome. <coughs> so, you know, think about the time of Japanese internment, or um, think about what's happening right now with uh, the way Syrians are being characterized as you know, their pain, a place they just can't live and rather live, but can't live anymore. There could be this kind of conform, well, I need to go along for my security, for the country's security. These kinds of prejudice, um, the courts say, um, could cause a juror to uh, be partial and therefore to lead to a situation where you wouldn't have a fair trial. Um, the court says that there are difficulties in erasing uh, prejudice because it's insidious. Uh, we, we underestimate the insidious nature of our preformed opinions, our preconceptions, and they go unchallenged. They actually sit in our unconsciousness, and they shape our daily behavior. The court says, buried deep in the human psyche, these preconceptions cannot be easily and effectively identified and set aside, even if one wishes to do so. They're invasive, they're elusive, they're corrosive. And therefore, we need to bring them into the open through a challenge process. Of course, there's difficulties in proving prejudice, but the court comes to the conclusion that you don't need sort of a high standard of social science evidence uh, to say that this particular case will have an unjust outcome 
uh, because of the, the prejudice uh, that people hold. All you need is a realistic potential for partiality. You don't need proof, ironclad proof, of partiality and bias, just a realistic potential. And if that's raised again through evidence, reports, judicial notice, um, then you can, um, again, challenge for cause. The cause being that they are uh, less than partial. There's two kinds of inquiries here. The inquiry about whether or not there's <coughs> racism in the community more generally. And then the second inquiry is like, are you potential juror biased? Well, what are they going to say? Some people will actually say, yeah, I am. But some people who wouldn't admit to it, the court says in uh, paragraph 50, um, are sensitized from the outset of the proceedings regarding the need to confront racial prejudice. And just by having this conversation, making it explicit, could um, help them in their judgments. It could also enhance the appearance of fairness in the eyes of the accused. It's, this is just not just an essential safeguard um, under Section 11 for a fair trial. It's also under Section 15. It's about equality uh, that people would be able to have these kinds of opportunities to consider their prejudice. Um, Garden prejudice, garden variety prejudice must be challenged. It doesn't have to be like you know, Ku Klux Klan membership. Um, just, just ordinary ways that we might form preconceptions that actually could be detrimental uh, to the accused. And what the court finds that racism in Victoria is proven. And you can have judicial notice from this point forward to be able to challenge for cause. I have to say that in studying this case, I felt the importance of continuing to examine my own sense of what I carry around inside me, which could be harmful, detrimental, um, not helpful in the way that I walk through the world and deal uh, with others. I hope you might have had at least some similar experience, I would hope that this, if it operates, would cause the same in jurors and judges. This takes us right back to the Marshall case. It's not maybe just jurors that are partial. <coughs> judges themselves have work to do, as I have work to do. It's not just accusing others of this. There's stuff in each of us, or at least in me, um, that I continue to have to work through in this regard as well. So that's it. Next class, we'll take up uh, the issues of alternatives to dealing with criminal justice issues before Wednesday, concluding with the Gladue Healy line of cases. And I've got your quiz here.